Okay, good morning guys and welcome along to the Fat Profits Research Webinar for this Wednesday, the 22nd of October. My name is Kai Lewis, I'm one of the equities analysts on the floor here and joining us today will be Greg Smith, the Head of Research. So guys, as always, this is an interactive session so you can ask questions throughout the presentation. Just click on that little orange arrow towards the top of your screen and you can type in your questions there in that box highlighted below. So type those through uh, throughout the, the course of the presentation, we'll try to answer as many as we can towards the end. Now as always guys, this presentation is intended to be general advice in nature so we don't take your personal situation into account and also past performance is no indicator of future performance. So we'll get things going now guys, uh, first things first, good morning Greg. Can you hear me there Greg? Good morning Kai, good morning everyone. Excellent. Okay, guys, so uh, we're going to have a chat today specifically about the banks, the big four banks. Everyone's got them, everyone's looking at them and wondering what they're going to do next. So, uh, Greg, first of all, there's been a lot of talk about them, obviously, uh, lately. What is it that the banks are at the centre of attention for so many investors at the moment? Yeah, there certainly has been a lot of talk about the banks, Kai, and uh, obviously, as you point out, they are widely held, and uh, we've certainly had plenty of queries from members and uh, in the last... A uh, few research webinars as well, which is why we're uh, holding a, a dedicated webinar just on just on the banks. Um, like I suppose yeah, the big thing about the banks is they've historically, certainly in Australia, been seen as safe or low risk. Uh, I guess that's gone with the fact they've been earning pretty decent uh, profits and super normal ones at that. And they've also obviously come with the growth of our stock market. Uh, very widely held by investors and you look at that slide there it really puts it in perspective in terms of the proportion of, of the share market of the banking sector and uh, Australia's sort of uh, top of the podium uh, as can be seen so that's why there's, every day that goes by the, the banks tend to feature uh, as topics of conversation in one shape or form or another and obviously they've been a particular um, uh, focus in the last few weeks with respect to uh, various, various risks that are, are perceived. Um, if you go to, to the next slide as well, um, just turning over there, I think we'll also see uh, that yeah, where the banks sort of stand in terms of their market caps, in terms of the, uh, the, yeah, the sheer scale of the, of, the, of the big four as it were. Also, you're looking at very good yields as well, around about the five five and a half percent mark and that's been a key attraction of course that sort of also comes back to uh, why investors are interested in the banks and they're interested in maintaining or seeing those healthy dividend checks continue to come in which they've been used to and uh, obviously we don't really want to see those those big payout ratios uh, threatened. If we can scroll forward to the next slide. Again, you'll see where our uh, individual banks sort of feature in terms of the top 15 banks, banks by market cap. And again, they're right up there. And so again, these are big investment houses or big uh, stocks, as it were, in terms of, in terms of the market's perception. And that's really why they're a centre of attention for many investors. So, Greg, how have the banks been performing financially in recent years? And uh, you know, obviously, it's been it's been fairly good over the last couple, in particular. Is this about to change? Well, certainly recently, as we turn to the next slide, they have had very much a, um, a purple patch in earnings, and that's uh, also enabled them to deliver, as we show here, really sizable payout ratios if you look at them on a global perspective. Uh, they've been buoyed in particular by a low interest rate environment and the strength in the housing market, and that's flowed through to mortgage lending, which has been very robust and created that period of uh, super, normal, super normal profits. Um, the low interest rate environment is certainly part of it. Uh, also, we've seen cost cutting as well, uh, which has been, which is, which has occurred over the recent years, and that's also underpinned things from an earnings perspective as well. And this this chart here really, uh, really puts it in, in perspective. Now, in terms of whether this is about to change or not, there are, an, I suppose, a number of risks. Uh, to the earnings story uh, in terms of the Australian banking sector. And one that's really been pointed out is, is the party going to end as far as the Australian housing market goes? Um, we've obviously seen a low interest rate environment stimulate mortgage lending, stimulate house prices, and the, and the big banks have benefited. And you uh, mentioned there the risk to the mortgage lending there, Greg. Sorry, but how do the banks stack from a capital position when it comes to that, uh, that mortgage lending? I think as well from a from a capital uh, perspective, 
our, our banks stay, stand pretty well on a in terms of a global perspective. Um, I think we've got a, a slide coming up here on uh, on where they stand from a capital perspective. If we just sort of flick over. Well, first of all, let's have a look at the uh, the interest rates there, Greg. So the RBA cash rate, and uh, obviously it's yeah. been fairly flat line for a while. The best thing, yeah, probably the best thing to do is to sort of revert back to what I was saying, Kai, about the about the the housing market, about the low interest rate environment that we've seen with respect to the banks. And this, if you look at the cash rate that has come down over the last few years, this is really what has underpinned earnings as far as uh, the banks go. So there's, we've seen, I suppose, a lot of toing and froing, particularly this year. Is the RBA going to raise rates? Uh, is that going to impact the housing market? And how is that going to impact the banks? And I think from our perspective, a rate increase is probably something that, although it is a risk, it is likely to remain off the table. And the key thing about that is it's not to say that the RBA isn't worried about the housing market. They certainly are. But they're also more worried about the impact of a of raising interest rates on the Australian dollar and how that would impact other aspects of the economy. And we've seen very much in the RBA's rhetoric uh, lately that they are, they are concerned about a dollar, even though it has come down in, in recent weeks, they're still making the point, and this was made the point again this week in the minutes, that from a historic perspective, the Australian dollar uh, is still relatively high. So I think that's why um, the, the interest rate side of things is potentially going to be off the table. But looking at this slide, this sort of gives us a little bit of an idea of what may be the key risk to banks, and this is sort of what I was alluding to about capital. We're seeing a financial system in inquiry underway at the moment, which has been dubbed the Murray Inquiry. And the outcome of this is due to come out uh, next month. And this is sort of re really what's got people a little bit worried in terms of the capital position of banks. As you see, the uh, we've got obviously the total assets shown there, which range from just under 700 billion through to uh, just over 800 billion. And in some cases, the loans to total assets is quite sizable. If you look at uh, Westpac, it's getting up to near 80%. Now, if banks are forced to hold more capital, that's certainly going to crimp the mortgage lending side of things. And that's, I think, what investors are a little bit worried about. It's interesting to note that the previous reviews of the financial sector that were undertaken in 1981 and 1987 both led to some major changes. So that's also got people a little bit worried about what the outcome of that review when it comes out uh, Late, uh, later next month. But in, th in terms of our view of the shakeup, we don't think that the outcome is going to be uh, as, as punitive as feared. I think there may be uh, some case for a modest increase in capital requirements, but you have to also realise as well that whilst the RBA is concerned about the housing market, and they made this point again in their minutes, and uh, the Deputy Governor also made this point in a speech yesterday, uh, they are concerned about the housing market, they are concerned about it getting a little bit are more out of control. They also don't don't want to see it crash. So they have to strike something of a middle 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 row, as it were. So that's why I think that the outcome of the Murray inquiry isn't going to be as punitive as feared. Uh, but that then brings us to the question about how the banks stack uh, from a from a capital position at the moment. And you'll see, as this slide here shows, if you look at the capital positions of each of the major uh, banks where it stands currently versus the required minimum and versus the likely proposed increase uh, in capital. There's, there's, a, there's a decent buffer there. There's a decent buffer there in each case. So even if the outcome is, yes, the banks need to hold more capital, um, they are well braced to, to withstand this. And also, if you look at it, I suppose, from uh, whilst obviously the, the RBA would like uh, banks to hold more capital, uh, so they can obviously cool the housing market because they don't really want to go ahead and raise interest rates. Um, yeah, there is that buffer there. Uh, the other point is if you look at you know, where their banks stand from a rating perspective and in terms of versus uh, global peers, uh, they're, they're actually fairly well positioned. Uh, the ratings, I think, if we go scroll forward to the next slide, are, uh, are pretty credible on, on, a, on a global basis. So you're looking down the line there in terms of that uh, AA with S&P and A2 with Moody's. Uh, our banks are well regarded in terms of the capital that they're, they're generally holding and also their, their financial robustness, as it were. So while there's been a lot of scaremongering about the capital positions of banks, uh, which, are, as I mentioned right at the outset, are traditionally regarded as safe, you, you can see that they are well backed. 
if you just scroll forward to the uh, to the next slide as well, Kai, this sort of goes back to the point I was also saying that the reason investors are concerned about the outcome of the Murray inquiry, as it's dubbed in particular, are that if banks are required to hold more capital, that's going to reduce their returns and that's going to inevitably have some impact on profitability and that's what's really concerning uh, investors at the moment. But just to, to recap in our view, we don't think the capital requirements are going to be as punitive as Fed, so those, whilst we may see a decline uh, in profitability by some measure in the, the end of the purple patch, uh, as, it, as it were, that um, yeah, the, the, there's still going to be decent earnings growth there coming through and that, as I mentioned is also going to be supported by that low interest rate environment as well. The other point I would just also make just about the, I suppose the bank profitability and I alluded to it, to it earlier was that some profits have also been generated or part of the profit expansion has been generated from cost cutting and there's possibly limited scope for more costs being taken out going forward which is also going to crimp that earnings growth a little bit and this is particularly as we're in a I suppose an even uh, ever growing or tighter regulatory environment as well which is imposing costs on the banks. Uh, the other thing that's also driven profitability uh, in recent years as well is that uh, improvement in the, in the loan books as well or credit quality and you've seen a reduction in loss provisions, tighter control, so there's probably limited bandwidth for that to, to be a source of earnings growth as well. So what I think we're really seeing is we're seeing a, a contraction in those super normal profits. The banks are still going to be making money, make no mistake, and they're still going to be paying good dividends, uh, but the significant, credit, uh, significant earnings growth we've seen of recent years may be somewhat capped. So if we turn to the dividends for just a moment there, Greg, and that's really what's on the uh, on everyone's minds, whether these uh, these banks can provide that ongoing yield, and it has been a fantastic yield over the last few years. What are our thoughts on the on the yield for the big four banks moving forward? Yeah, I, th I think as, as the chart highlights, uh, the yeah, the yields have been have been generally pretty pretty significant over the uh, over the years, and that's really been the attraction of the banks. So I think the the, the prospect of uh, yield expansion or increases in dividends is going to be less going forward than what it was and that's probably also going to translate into the share price outperformance that you've seen in recent years uh, being not as stellar as it has been. Uh, I don't think we're suddenly going to see the banks go out there and uh, start slashing their dividend payouts, I don't think we're going to see that. In terms of the growth going forward in those payouts, uh, or the cents per share going back to end investors, uh, that's going to be somewhat capped. So on the note as well there, Greg, so the, the banks have pulled back from their highs recently. Um, do we think that they're cheap right now? What's our strategy here? Yeah, I suppose cheap's, uh, of course, a, a, a relative term, and there's, there's certainly been a, like a multiple expansion in, in recent years. Uh, and, and looking at the earnings multiples, I think we've got a slide here, as it stands, the banks Aren't, aren't overly expensive. But the key really is um, what changes are we going to see to those uh, that the multiples currently being attributed if the capital requirements are more onerous than, than expected uh, and, and if that mortgage lending slows more, more abruptly than expected. So that's really going to shape things. I think in terms of um, being stand out cheap in terms of the market, I wouldn't say we're there yet. And this, this slide actually also highlights a point as well in terms of the forecast earnings multiple for, uh, for, the, for the big four banks. So obviously we're looking at 14 times uh, for, for 2014 and also on a price to book basis, uh, certainly not, not, not overly cheap at 2.8 times. Uh, and this is probably a little bit of an unfair comparison in some ways, but it does highlight uh, how how, uh, how how the sector is viewed in, uh, in in emerging markets or China in particular. And we're looking there at a um, an earnings multiple five times and trading for less than book value. So certainly on a relative basis, uh, you you wouldn't say that uh, our banks are overly cheap uh, from an earnings or book value basis. But I think the key thing is you know, do we do we think they're worth buying at current levels? Uh, do we think they're worth holding from a, from a medium to longer term perspective. And I think that's, you know, you talk about our strategy and that's really what we have um, been doing recently. We obviously 
recommended a lot of the banks early on. We've done well on our recommendations on the banks generally, the, the, the big four that we've been involved in, along with uh, some of the, the regionals. And really the view we're taking is we're looking at banking profits, locking in those gains, uh, and, and we've issued a couple of sell half recommendations in the past uh, two weeks, a sell half on ANZ last week and a sell half on Westpac uh, last, last night's report. So selling half, it's basically we're taking profits off the table, we still like the banks medium to longer term. And, uh, and that's really been the strategy at the moment. And if you look at, see on the chart at, uh, of Westpac, we got in there at $24.82. We've seen over $7 worth of dividends paid since we've held the stock, which highlights uh, the, the, the income return that we've seen. And we've just chosen to take some profits off the table around about current levels, just given the, the near-term headwinds to that uh, earnings growth expansion that I talked about earlier. And a similar story to ANZ last week as well there, Greg, we, we've also taken some profits off the table there. That's right. So again, ANZ, uh, even more compelling from a, a uh, profit perspective on our recommendation, we got in there at $17. Uh, it's returned over $7 in dividends again. And again, we're just taking something off the table, retaining a holding for a medium to long term exposure. And a lot of questions around uh, Bank of Queensland recently, which uh, we still hold. We have taken profits on it in the past, uh, but a lot of people asking whether this is, uh, is still worth taking a closer look at and whether we would be perhaps putting a buyback on it sooner rather than later. Yeah, I mean, Bank of Queensland is def definitely one that stands out. And it, it sort of, I suppose, relates back a little bit to, uh, to the strategy at the moment. I mean, uh, another question we've got is, you know, if we saw a big pullback in the banks, would we be out there issuing buy recommendations? And again, it's something we would look at, and it would, it would really depend on um, what uh, to what degree bank prices weakened or stock prices weakened from current levels. But I think in terms of the first cabs off the rank, and th this is why we've highlighted Bank of Queensland, we'd probably be looking below the big four in terms of uh, adding to our positions or recommending uh, buy recommendations for members in, in the sector. And Bank of Queensland stands out on a number of accounts, uh, uh, not just not just because uh, their the CEO has left uh, uh, to pursue other opportunities, but more so that they've lagged uh, the, the big four in terms of their performance. And there's, a, there's really a discount when you're looking at Bank of Queensland versus the other banks, which is fair in many ways. Uh, Bank of Queensland is heavily concentrated, as the name would suggest, and as many people would know, in the, in the Queensland region. So that's part of why we're seeing a discount. But I suppose from our perspective, that potential weakness is also uh, a potential strength as well. In the Queensland region, obviously we've seen a, a fairly robust housing market in Australia generally, but hotspots have generally stood out head and shoulders. So we're looking at the likes of Sydney, New South Wales, Melbourne and Victoria. And areas such as Queensland have, have, have lagged. And you've seen a, a, a much worse sort of cyclical downturn in, say, uh, in Queensland and the Gold Coast, for example. And this is an area which we think will play catch up. And it's probably lagging the, rest of the, the hotspots by about 12 months or so. We think there's going to be a period of catch up and really what that's also going to be boosted by uh, is the decline and po possible further declines in the Australian dollar. And of course if we get that, that's going to attract tourists, not only overseas but domestic tourists, back to the Queensland region. That's also going to help the momentum we feel with, re with the region and also with property prices. So in terms of issuing buys on new, uh, or new buys on st banking stocks, yeah, certainly Bank of Queensland would stand out as one we would consider. Okay, so lots of questions coming here through, Greg. We might uh, might just cross to a couple of those now uh, because they do relate to the banks. So uh, we've got a question from Jeff, and Jeff is asking, if we move out of banks, where do we go from here for safe income? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a great point, Jeff. And obviously uh, it leaves, uh, and as the first chart, first slide showed in terms of the uh, our market's reliance on, on banks as a, as a source of yield, yeah, it, it is a it is a big hole to fill. Big hole to, to fill. I think. Look, the important point is, as I mentioned, we're not necessarily saying moving out of banks. What we're really saying at the moment is reducing exposure. We do think that that strong dividend appeal will be there over the medium to longer term. So, as I mentioned, we don't think that the uh, the dividend yields that you, the healthy yields that you're currently seeing with the banks are going to evaporate. Certainly, you know, if we're taking profits and we're uh, moving a little bit of capital out of the banks, you know, if you're a low-risk investor and looking to replace it with like for like, you, you, we, we would be inclined 
to uh, to look at obviously high yielding plays as, as well to replace that. Obviously there are, are other areas to go in the markets, you know, the telecoms for instance, uh, obviously Telstra has led the way but there are other companies in, in the telecom sector which are, are starting to, to edge up their dividend yields or dividend payouts as well. Uh, the property sector as well, we think there's further left than that. Uh, what, in terms of what I've been alluding to with respect to interest rates, and we're also seeing yields start to tick up there as well. But I think the, the bottom line is that the banks we still feel have, have a place in a medium to long term portfolio and are going to continue to provide um, some yield support to those portfolios. And we've got a question here from Kelly as well. And uh, Kelly is asking uh, at present, do we see these stocks as really overpriced in comparison to returns? And that's, that's particularly uh, you know, applicable given the slide we saw with the Australian banks versus the Chinese big four banks, for instance. Do we see them as overpriced, Greg? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I, and I guess, again, I suppose the hint is in, in what, we've been, <coughs> excuse me, what we've been doing recently with respect to taking, um, taking profits. Um, they're certainly not cheap. And, and that slide was made clear in the comparison with the Chinese banks. So, we, and again, that's also why I think we would need to see a reasonable correction from current levels, even though the, the banks have already come off a little bit, for us to consider uh, the banks as buy. So, I think we would, would be more siding with the fact that, from a near-term perspective, they are overpriced. And this also goes with the risks that the banks are facing. You know, as I mentioned, you've got that uh, Murray inquiry coming up. Uh, you've got sort of some some doubt over what's going to happen with respect to capital adequacy and positions, uh, and obviously you've also got a little bit of doubt there over the over the housing market, uh, and finally as well in terms of the ability to grow the earnings through stripping out costs uh, and reducing provisions further. I mean that's going to be fairly limited. So I think yeah you're more looking at the over price, but from a medium to longer term perspective, um, they, they still hold value in that regard. And a question here from Tessa there, Greg. Tessa's asking, uh, would you recommend a sell half on NAB as well? So NAB is not one that we cover, Tessa. Obviously, uh, like for like in a, in a lot of ways compared to the big four. So do we have any comments there, Greg? I think I, th I think it's uh, that, that's fair what you say, Kai. I mean, we, it's not a stock that we, do, we cover, but we are looking at this from a sector point of view. Uh, we're looking at all the banks we held. We've look, looked at two of them in the last two weeks. We'll be looking at the remaining two in the next two weeks. And we are... I suppose following a similar tactical line, so we don't, we haven't recommended it NAB, and we don't hold it in our uh, research portfolios. But um, yeah, potentially that some similar top-down line could be followed. And another question here, uh, this one's from Kelly. Uh, a buy was in place for Suncorp recently. Uh, are we still favouring this stock uh, at the moment? And the answer is certainly yes, Kelly. So that's actually a, a pretty reasonable like-for-like -like stock in a lot of ways. Obviously more more skewed towards the insurance market as well as banking and business banking in particular. Um, but what do we like about, about Suncorp at the moment, Greg? Yeah, I think again, similar to, to what I was saying about Bank of Queensland, the Suncorp strength is an exposure to that region. Obviously you mentioned that there's obviously different parts to the business on the insurance side, but um, that potentially viewed as a weakness could also be a, a great strength. So we, we also do see further strength in, in insurance stocks generally, which will help. I mean, interestingly, obviously, in recent weeks and months, it's been mooted that Bank of Queensland has looked at combining or with Suncor, the two have gotten together. And that, uh, yeah, that would be obviously a very interesting combination as suddenly you would have an enlarged entity with, which could actually be a credible challenge to the big four. I suppose much has been made of the fact that you know, they would have a concentration or a double whammy in terms of their concentration in Queensland. But uh, you look, as I mentioned earlier, I think that would be that would be a uh, that would be a potential strength, particularly if we see further weakness in the currency. And we'll move on to the other uh, final topic here, and, and a lot of questions coming through, guys, uh, about the the Medibank float. So uh, we haven't covered it off specifically yet. We're just waiting on some further information. But Greg, can you tell us a bit about what we think about the potential of the uh, the Medibank IPO so far? Yeah, obviously this is a big one as far as the uh, Australian market is concerned, and the prospectus uh, came out this week. Uh, the offer period opens next week, and what we're actually going to be doing is covering it uh, in next week's report with respect to our, with respect to our detailed view uh, and, and recommendation for members. But look, on the face of it, it certainly looks interesting. Uh, value, you know, the company's valued around about just over 16 times to 21 times forecast earnings, depending 
on the band, and that, this is in line with global peers, so certainly not expensive. But I suppose the key thing with uh, with Medibank, and which you may see, with the, there is a potential for earnings to be boosted through cost cutting on one hand, and this is potentially going to happen as you see a company move uh, from the public to the private arena. And management have said they're going to be targeting costs paid out to private hospitals uh, for one, uh, and they can also improve earnings potentially through better claims management and again this is all what comes potentially from moving from the public uh, to the to the private arena. The, year, the shares are also going to come off a nice yield as well, we've been talking a lot about yield today and uh, you're looking at a yield of between 4.2 and 5.4 percent so that's potentially attractive as well and uh, you know, obviously potentially fill part of that hole if, you, if, you, if you're selling half of one of your banking exposures. It's going to be a sizable one for the market to, to digest in terms of the uh, the market value. Uh, it's going to be very obviously popular, I think, uh, as is already indicated with the pre-registrations. Uh, market value is going to be 4.27 to 5.51 billion. Interesting timing. Obviously, it's been we've had a pretty volatile market over the last few weeks, but uh, it looks like uh, the government uh, will be breathing a sigh of relief that uh, we've had some strength return of late. It's also sort of worth pointing out, and there's a little bit of prior form with respect to uh, government asset sales. <clears throat> Generally, and so we had uh, QR National, uh, now Horizon, that was uh, the country's largest freight company that was floated back in November 2010. That performed pretty well uh, in the first uh, couple of years. So different businesses, of course, but I look at it as an indication that, uh, that these things can work out well. But yeah, we'll be giving you a, a detailed view in, uh, in next week's report. So that probably covers off quite a number of questions we've got through on the, uh, the Medibank float for, for now, guys. What I might do, we've got a lot of similar questions coming through. I'm just going to run a poll there, so we, uh, we might chuck that up now uh, so you can click on that. Uh, a couple more questions here, Greg. So we have one from John, and John is asking uh, about the, uh, well, the, the Aussie, Aussie dollar here. What do we see it doing from here in, in the, uh, the medium to short term? I think it's. I think in the short term, obviously, we've seen a, a pretty. Uh, we've seen a little bit of a relief rally. Obviously, we've seen a pretty serious, pretty, well, pretty significant, should I say, decline in the Aussie dollar, and certainly welcome yeah, with respect to the economy. And I think it's certainly something that the RBA has been angling for, uh, and it's going to help. Obviously, help out a number of areas, particularly obviously on the on the export side and also economy in general. In terms of where to from here, near term. Obviously, we may see some consolidation after that uh, steep decline that we've we've seen, but I think further out we'll possibly be looking for uh, for further weakness, and it'll be interesting to see so the RBA has talked about and, and I mentioned about the minutes that came out uh, this week. They've noted obviously the decline we've had in the Aussie dollar, but it's quite clear that they would like to see further weakness, uh, and that they've talked about that. So whether you know, we we see some more jawboning trying to uh, edge that down further. Uh, will will be interesting, but it is worth pointing out that even though the the, the currency has declined, it's still quite high from a historical perspective. So I think you know, we're potentially going to be uh, be looking at further weakness over the medium term. Okay, and we've got another question here, Greg, from Peter, and Peter's asking, uh, well, about the market generally, but specifically about dividend yielders and, and the volatility we've seen around them right now. So the banks, for one, uh, and, and some of the other traditional dividend yielding stocks, they haven't been immune from the market weakness recently, have they? That's right. I mean, it's been an interesting one, really, because we've obviously we've seen volatility, and uh, in previous times when we've seen volatility, it's tend to be tended to be a risk off. So it's been the sort of the higher risk plays, um, lower yielding plays which have suffered, but it's been fairly broad based and yeah, there has been quite a lot of selling in yielders. Now we've talked about the reasons for, for weakness in the banks, but it has been across the income payers. One uh, uh, reason for this, I suppose, is what, what, and this sort of happened a couple of weeks ago with suggestions that the Federal Reserve was going to suddenly start uh, raising interest rates and then I think we there was a bit of fear in terms of uh, fund flows from Australia in, in theory that uh, the with interest rates set to, to rise in America that's a more attractive destination so we did see money coming out of the yielding plays on the back of that but we've seen a bit go back in and which makes complete sense and we did say at the time a, a couple of counts actually firstly uh, whilst uh, America may raise rates sooner than Australia does, the timeline for that is still going to be uh, um, extended into the future and, and we've heard be before Chris certainly go along with that. 
uh, we think even more likely we will be looking at the second half of uh, next year in terms of rate rises in the US. And we've actually had comments from members of the committee interestingly say that it could even be 2016. So I think investors have got a little bit ahead of themselves thinking that um, America's uh, suddenly going to be the, the go-to yield destination. Of course, it's also worth noting that the uh, American stock market is uh, rates pretty lowly in terms of yield, particularly when you compare it versus Australia. But as the other point in terms of local investors as well, the reality is that with the environment for interest rates set to remain low, uh, the Australian stock market still stands out as a, as a yield destination, and I think it's going to continue to enjoy support uh, on that basis. And that's another reason possibly why the, the banks have recovered from the recent sell-off. Okay, so Greg, we might wrap things up now. We've uh, got a few more questions streaming through, but I'll close that poll down there, guys. So if you want to click on that, you've got a couple more seconds to do so. Uh, so we'll wrap things up. So thanks for joining us today, Greg. Thanks, Kai, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Now, guys, a lot of people here, you have clicked on the uh, the option, uh, would you like to watch more webinars? We actually do have a research webinar again this afternoon, 2.30 Eastern Standard Time. So if you'd like to find out more information about that or indeed anything else we've covered off today, just give us a call, 1300 8811 or email us through invest at fatprofits.com.au. So thanks for joining us today, guys. Enjoy the trading today and enjoy your morning. <laughs>